Hi, my name is Frank Ermantraut. I'm one of the captains here at Dallas Fire and EMS, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about heat stress recognition in firefighters. This presentation is geared a little bit more towards our support team, but it has a lot of information that could be beneficial for all of our department's members. We're going to talk a little bit about the purpose of this training. We're going to talk a little bit about heat-related emergencies and more specifically what that looks like and what causes that um, for firefighters. We're going to go over the Regional Fire Operating Guideline and discuss rehabilitation as it's outlined in that guideline. And then we're going to discuss a few cooling techniques that can be used when a firefighter is sent to rehab. So we do this because our organization has a duty to protect all of its members. This includes our firefighters when they're working on a fire ground. One of the ways we do this is by providing rehabilitation that's staffed with our support team. To make our support team more effective, we make sure that they have training that helps them recognize when a firefighter is under duress or is suffering from some sort of medical emergency and we also want to make sure that they know how to recognize when a firefighter is suffering from some sort of heat stress. This also places us more in line with our regional operating guidelines as well as aligns us with the national standards for firefighter rehabilitation. So heat stress or heat related illnesses have several factors that contribute to them. For us as firefighters, one of the biggest factors is the amount of exertion that we present or put out on a fire scene. In fact, as far as professions go, we have the highest amount of short-term energy expenditure than any other profession. This means that when we do perform work, we work very hard for a very short amount of time. This places our body in kind of a predicament because that's not necessarily how the human body is supposed to work. Um, so if you imagine a structure fire, the first 10 or 15 minutes of a working structure fire are very hard on a firefighter's body. We work very hard for a very short amount of time. But there are also those circumstances where you might work a mild or moderate amount for a very long time. Think of a wildland fire that has a longer operational period. We might have firefighters working 8 to 12 hours with a little bit of rest uh, every now and then, but really that extended operation causes them to have some sort of heat stress. We also wear personal protective equipment that doesn't allow us to release heat. So that personal protective equipment, our turnouts, are, is, it's really good at keeping heat outside of our body and heat outside of those turnouts, but it also traps in all the heat that we create when we metabolize. So when we're doing a lot of work, our metabolism goes off, that creates a lot of heat, and our turnouts just trap that heat, um, which actually causes our body temperature to rise significantly, and we'll see that in a few minutes. We also work in environments that do not allow for heat to uh, be expelled from our bodies very easily. Think about uh, those circumstances where it's a really hot day, the relative humidity is really high, and there's not a whole lot of wind, um, and we're fighting a grass fire. Uh, our bodies are not going to be able to release that heat as quickly as if there was a slight breeze and it was a little bit cooler outside. Also, we don't always do a great job keeping ourselves hydrated. So normally, if we know that we have some sort of big event coming up that's going to require some significant physical exertion, we spend a couple of days preparing for that. And so we drink water regularly, we eat good meals, we make sure that we put a lot of veggies on our plate. Well, that's not always the case with firefighters. And so if we end up getting a firefighter at 2 a.m., and the day before we haven't really drank our water and we didn't really eat good meals, we just ate a bunch of pizza for dinner and that was it, uh, we're not going to perform as effectively and our body isn't going to be able to adjust to all the heat that we're um, creating. And we're not going to do as well than if we were well hydrated and had a very healthy meal.
all things that impact us as, as, as firefighters and can contribute to uh, heat stress or heat related injury or illness. So this video is going to talk a little bit about heat stress in firefighters and real specifically what happens um, during a fire. This video is about heat stress in firefighters. The topics covered are what is heat stress, how can firefighters get heat stress, and what are the health effects of heat stress. Heat stress, which is also called hyperthermia, occurs when heat builds up inside the body faster than it can be released. Heat can be absorbed by the body from different sources. The first is heat that comes from outside the body, the environment. For example, heat absorbed by working in hot environment, which is very typical of firefighters. When you're standing in the sun or close to a bonfire or even eating hot food. The second is heat that is generated inside the body due to various metabolic functions like digesting food or when you are doing a physically intensive job or from physical activities in general. The human body and all its components work best when the temperature at the core of the body is around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 37 degrees centigrade. As heat is absorbed, core body temperature rises. This may lead to heat stress, which in turn causes serious health effects. At this stage, our body's thermostat kicks in and tries to bring the core temperature back to optimum level. This is done by dissipating heat to the environment. Human body has several mechanisms for dissipating heat, such as sweating, radiation through body surface, that is skin, and rejecting heat by going to the bathroom. It is known that fluctuations of more than a few degrees Fahrenheit in the core body temperature can cause serious short-term and long-term health effects. How can firefighters get heat stress? Firefighters are exposed to hot environments on a regular basis. Even when they are not making fire runs, their job involves physically demanding labor that can generate a lot of heat inside the firefighters' bodies. Unfortunately, the very same fire protective suit that saves their lives from fire also subjects the firefighters to additional heat load. This happens because although fire not penetrate the suit, heat can. This radiative heat enters the suit and heats up the body, bringing up the temperature of core body and also the temperature of air around the body. Since core body temperature rises, body tries to reject heat. A lot of dissipated heat is trapped between the body and the suit. To make matters worse, the heavy gear the firefighters have to carry with them increases the physical demand and slows down the heat dissipation. Heat stress is known to have several acute health effects depending upon the severity of the stress. Heat stroke, heat exhaustion, heat syncope, heat cramps, and heat rash. Heat stroke being the most severe health effect and heat rash being the least severe. What do these health effects mean and what are their symptoms? Heat rash is a skin irritation caused by excessive sweating during hot, humid weather. Symptoms of heat rash include red clusters of pimples or small blisters which are more likely to occur on the neck and upper chest, in the groin, under the breasts, and in elbow creases. Heat cramps are caused due to profuse sweating. Doing strenuous exercise or working in a hot environment can lead to excessive sweating and loss of salt and moisture. Low salt levels in the muscles can cause heat cramps. Symptoms of heat cramps are muscle pains, spasms, usually in the abdomen, arms or legs. Heat syncope is an episode of fainting or dizziness resulting in hot environment especially without adequate hydration and acclimatization. Symptoms of heat syncope include lightheadedness, dizziness, and fainting. Heat exhaustion is the body's response to an excessive loss of water and salt, usually through excessive sweating. Workers most prone to heat exhaustion are those that are elderly, have high blood pressure, and those working in a hot environment, example firefighters. 
Symptoms of heat exhaustion include heavy sweating, extreme weakness or fatigue, dizziness, confusion, nausea, clammy or moist skin, pale or flushed complexion, muscle cramps, slightly elevated body temperature, fast and shallow breathing. Heat stroke occurs when body cannot regulate its temperature. This may happen if it absorbs or generates heat faster than it can dissipate. Body temperatures can reach up to 106 degrees Fahrenheit within 10 to 15 minutes. Heat stroke can cause death if immediate emergency treatment is not given. Symptoms of heat stroke include hot, dry skin or profuse sweating, hallucinations, chills, throbbing headache, high body temperature, confusion, dizziness, or slurred speech. Apart from the acute health effects, heat stress can also cause fatigue and elevated heart rate. Muscle efficiency is reduced significantly from fatigue and working in hot environment. This is especially relevant for firefighters as they perform physically demanding job while inside a hot environment. Performing at a level less than 100% can increase their risk of accidents and mishaps. In order to perform their job as safely as possible, it is extremely important for firefighters to maintain adequate hydration levels, remain physically fit, and take steps to ensure adequate recovery between runs. Thank you for watching this video. It was brought to you by ERC, University of Cincinnati. Please take a few minutes to fill out the 5 item questionnaire. The link to the questionnaire is in the description of the video. Thank you. That video taught us some of the signs and symptoms of heat stress and other heat related injuries and illnesses. It's important to be able to recognize those signs and symptoms, not only for ourselves so that we know when we're hitting our limit, but also as a member of the team so that we can make sure our teammates are remaining safe and healthy. The organization follows the regional fire operating guidelines. These guidelines are followed by organizations in Polk and Marion County. As part of those guidelines, there's a specific portion that covers rehabilitation, and we're going to cover it now. So rehabilitation should be established whenever the incident commander or the incident safety officer believes it will be a benefit to those who had responded or the response personnel. You should also consider rehab after personnel go through two SCBA bottles. This is kind of the standard because by the time you've gone through two SCBA bottles, you've been in an IDLH atmosphere for a significant amount of time, and more than likely you've been working or expending energy in that atmosphere. Additionally, just as a member of a team, you should be aware of your own physical limitations. So if you start to feel any signs or symptoms of heat stress like the heat cramps or the dizziness or you notice that one of your teammates maybe is a little bit more unsteady on their feet then you have a responsibility to talk to your company officer and let them know um, those things and they'll make sure that you guys get exchanged out into rehab fairly quickly. Uh, it also talks about where rehab should be like we discussed before it should be away from uh, apparatus and far enough from the fire scene that the loud noises and the heat and the action of the fire scene um, doesn't interfere with the ability for the of the firefighter to to rest and relax a little bit. It should also ideally be in an area with some wind movement um, and some shade if it's hot out or if it's really cold out, uh, some place where they're protected from the elements. So this flowchart is taken from the fire operating guidelines. As you can see, if there's any sort of symptom in that list, so somebody's chest pain or shortness of breath, um, they're confused, they are dizzy, they can't really stand up, um, or any of their vital signs are outside of those limits um, there in front of you, it's important to immediately get them medical attention from the paramedics that are standing by on scene. Um, as support team members and those people staffing rehab, you have the authority to do that. So I know there are times when our ego gets in the way and we may not always want to um, A, go to rehab in the first place, but B, be evaluated by the paramedics. 
but it's important as support team members that we protect our firefighters by insisting that they be seen by paramedics when it's appropriate and by involving their company officer in that discussion. So if someone goes to rehab, we ask those questions of them we, um, regarding the signs and symptoms. We get them some water. We make sure that uh, they do those things that they need to do to start cooling off. And then we take their vital signs. And if their vital signs are uh, within the limits that you see in that flow chart, they just need to spend 10 minutes there and they get to go back to staging. Um, but if they're outside um, those limits, then they, after 10 minutes, you retake them. And if they're still outside of those limits after another 10 minutes, so 20 minutes total, um, then they need to be seen by the medical unit because after 20 minutes, our bodies should have enough time to release heat and relax after exerting ourselves and should return back to normal. Um, and so if it doesn't, there could be something more significant going on. So some of the things that we can do to help cool off in rehab um, is just by doffing our turnouts. Take your jackets off, take your hoods off. We should be doing that anyways to get the, um, the byproducts of combustion off of our skin. Uh, and then opening up your pants, just uh, unzipping them, undoing the button, and really opening up or even just pulling them down to your knees and letting all that heat um, from your legs get out of your pants to allow you to cool off. If it's hot out, we should be providing some shade or some other safe place to get them out of the heat. Uh, we should be providing them with plenty of water to drink. Um, the mister is on the support rig. We can use that in conjunction with a positive pressure vent fan and provide a nice cold mist for them, as well as um, if they're available, finding some cold rags, um, getting some wet rags and ice and putting them on the neck or underneath the armpits or someplace like that where there's a lot of blood flow and we can get a lot of heat off of those people. So just to sum up, our firefighters health is number one importance. So do those things before an incident occurs to keep yourself hydrated and healthy and limit the potential that you suffer from some sort of heat related illness or injury. So drink lots of water, keep yourself physically fit, try to eat a good meal every now and then. Um, and do those things to keep yourself healthy. Um, but also remember that as firefighters, we expend a lot of energy very quickly. Our turnouts don't allow our bodies to get that heat off of our body, so it just traps the heat in, and it really predisposes us to, to heat stress or heat illnesses. As rehab members and as support team members, uh, we need to protect our firefighters. So that means that we evaluate them, keep them cool, and that when necessary, we make sure that they're seen by uh, the paramedics that are on scene. And know that that is your job and that you have the authority to put a hard stop to them returning um, until they have that evaluation. But that should be done in conjunction with their company officer. And then just remember, when you are in rehab, that is the time for you to cool down. So open up your jacket, open up your pants, drink lots of water, um, and do those things to get the heat off your body. So if there's any questions on any of this material, always feel free to talk to me, and thanks for listening. Bye.